<laughs> Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the first keynote of the, world, the Sixth World Congress of Environmental and Resource Economists. I'm Laura Taylor. I'm the president of the Association of Environmental and Resource Economists, and I have the pleasure of introducing our first keynote to you tonight. Our keynote speaker tonight is Gina McCarthy, the 13th administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Administrator McCarthy was appointed by President Barack Obama and served as head of the EPA from 2013 to 2017. As administrator of the U.S. EPA, a position that is often referred to as Minister of the Environment in other countries, um, she was responsible for enforcing the nation's Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and numerous other environmental statutes. During her tenure, there were many accomplishments that moved the United States forward in protecting the environment, domestic public health, um, and also protecting the global public health through climate action. Perhaps most notably, Administrator McCarthy signed the Clean Power Plan, which committed the U.S., then, at that time, the nation's largest emitter of carbon dioxide, to reduce carbon emissions from the electric sector by 30 percent. As the nation's first set of standards for reducing carbon emissions, the Clean Power Plan provided an important signal of President Obama's commitment to domestic climate action. With over 30 years of service to the environment and public health, I could list many more accomplishments, but I wanted to share something a little more personal about Administrator McCarthy with you tonight. To do this, I asked, I turned to a good friend of mine, Al McGartland. Al, here, um, is director of the National Center for Environmental Economics, NCE, at the US EPA. Um, and he was inducted as a fellow of the Association of Environmental Resource Economists last year. As director of the office that is responsible for reviewing the benefit-cost analyses of all major regulations within the EPA, including the Clean Power Plan, Al interacted with the administrator throughout her tenure. And here are the thoughts he shared with me. I promise they're okay to share. Administrator McCarthy made sure that economics had a seat at her policy-making table, alongside law, public health, and environmental science. The administrator wove these into her policy-making with a strong belief that smart policy-making could support both a clean, improving environment and a robust, strong economy. She, more than any other administrator, promoted environmental improvements as public health gains, and our benefit-cost analyses played a role in informing this perspective and certainly supported this emphasis. Administrator McCarthy was a fierce fighter for the EPA and EPA science, but always insisted on our best economics and our best science. I often thought Administrator McCarthy gave us better peer review and more penetrating questions about our regulatory analyses than our science colleagues at the EPA. Administrator McCarthy directed researchers at the EPA to ask the right questions, the hard questions, and pushed her scientists out of their comfort zone. She appreciates debate, and because debate and discourse among many who all bring things that are different to the table, um, she believes that is how you uncover solutions and move forward. It is clear to me from my conversation with Al and with the administrator herself earlier today that under her tenure, the EPA worked under a guiding ethic of evidence-based policy. With this in mind, I very much look forward to hearing her thoughts tonight as she discusses a monumental shift that has occurred that can only be described as the assault on science, on the scientific method, and on evidence-based policy making. So with that, please join me in welcoming our first keynote speaker of the Sixth World Congress of Environmental Resource Economist, Gina McCarthy. Wow. <laughs> this is just, am I shrinking or what? Don't answer that question. Well, first of all, Laura, thank you for the terrific introduction, and thank you for mentioning Al and all the other great people who are at EPA or were at EPA who have escaped momentarily. 
Um, uh, I want to tell you that I love you. Bring that back to the other folks that are at EPA. They need all the love and tender love they can get. Um, and I'm here for them. And I, actually, I am here for them. So it's terrific to be here. Laura, thanks for the introduction. Thomas, thank you for inviting me. Uh, Gothenburg is a, a beautiful place to be. This is a wonderful thing to be in, in, uh, at a podium in a church. I think we should start singing. What do you think? <laughs> we shall overcome. No, maybe that's a little too extreme. Uh, but I, I, I really am excited to be here, although I never expected in my entire life to actually go to anything called the World Congress of Environmental Economics. Because I have to tell you that for the most part, you people have been the bane of my existence. <laughs> Seriously. You're so nerdy and you're so picky. You need to know everything about everything. You take all the creative juices out of people like me who want to change the world in a moment with absolutely no reason and no evidence, just like what's happening in Washington today. You better get there and tell them what for, because they really need to understand what the world is all about. And Laura, you're right. We are having some difficulties right now, uh, because people are not just attacking the science. They are attacking the scientists. And so I have to always think about how you make it through times like today. And one of the things I always do is I go back to the progress we've made. Because I think we forget, as things have gotten better, just how difficult things were before. And I think that means that the difficulties that we face today, we sometimes think that we cannot overcome them. And that means that we are giving up serious opportunities along the way. And we can't do that. So let me read you something that was written in 1946. It was a headline that called the smog that shrouded Los Angeles, a dirty gray blanket flung across the city. Another called it a dense, eye-stinging layer of smoke that dimmed the sun. LA was the preeminent pollution capital of the world. School was canceled for smog days. Orange County seemed to get its name from the color of the sky, not from the fruit that was grown there. And as pollution built, guess what happened? Serious numbers of people, millions of people, stood up and they said they weren't going to take it anymore. Earth Day was born. And with any of you around then, I know I was. Okay, the rest of you are stinking young people. Earth Day was born, and EPA, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, was created by the best, most wonderful president ever, who was also a Republican, Richard Nixon. Let's give a hint. No, let's not give a hint for Richard. I'm just kidding. No, he did create EPA. He just wasn't one of the greatest. Um, and U.S. Congress passed the Clean Air Act in 1970, charging EBA to set standards that paved the way for technologies like the catalytic converter, simple technology that has changed the world. It has innovated the way in which we transport, and there are more innovations to come. So we have to remember just how far we've come in order to keep our juices flowing, keep our energy level up. Let us understand and remember that we have to be hopeful. If you lose that, then you have given up before we have he even had the chance to fight the battle. And I don't know about you, but I am fighting. I am not rolling over. So we have to stand together. And this is an opportunity for us to hang out to remember how far we've come and to think about the challenges ahead. And I see EPA as, a, as just one of the most wonderful agencies that's filled with just an expertise to remind you of just how difficult it is to make change. Just that you can't have a good idea, but you need a basis in reality to make that idea come to life. That is evidence-based policy making. I am not the brightest bulb on anybody's Christmas tree or in anybody's menorah. I know I'm not. 
So the idea is that EPA acts as a referee to see how we protect individuals from pollution that would otherwise harm us. Why do we regulate? Is because the market has failed to account for the full harm that is happening in that marketplace. And individuals, especially those most vulnerable to pollution, can't stand up for themselves and make it change. That's why you have government. That's why we can't think that a lawler and dull in the, in the EPA in Washington, D.C. is going to take away or relieve us of our responsibility to stand up for those most vulnerable. This is exactly the time when we need to do just that. So let's not spend a whole lot of time talking about rules. Let's talk about the rules of the road, because I worry even a little bit more, less about the rollbacks than I do about the system of making decisions that right now is being chipped away and chipped away. I want to talk about the bedrock science that supports and always have supported strong, sensible standards, the science that empowers life-saving landmark laws like the Clean Air Act. And I want to remind you all of you little nerds in the audience, you're all little nerds in case you wondered if you were, you were in that camp or not. I want to remind you just how big a part that your science has played. You are scientists. You develop information that is crucial. If we work together, then we can work together to protect what we have accomplished and we can find a path forward. And I want you to leave this conference the way I'm going to try to get you to tonight, which is to a place where you recognize the value that you bring to the table, you won't let anybody keep you away from that table, and you are going to recognize that we are going to continue to change the world and we are going to make progress. Because this is a time of change. And with every time of change, there is great opportunity. So let's not mope, let's learn together, let's get energy from one another, and let's leave here doubly committed that we are going to stop any rollbacks that are happening that aren't based on science and the law. We are not going to tolerate it. Now look, I, I do recognize, because I'm, I'm not like an idiot, well sometimes maybe I am, but I'm not right now, I recognize that a lot of the work that I did is actually up for grabs at this point, or at least that the folks in DC would like it to be. And I know especially all the progress that we made on, on climate change, on reducing what I always call carbon pollution. Let's cut climate change down to size. It's a damn air pollutant. Let's treat it that way. We've addressed air pollution before. We've got to address it again. And I know that it's, it's very challenging, uh, but I have to tell you that I am not walking around like a dead woman walking. If you think you're going to catch me moping, you got another thing coming. So if I don't mope, you have no right to. I know you all have skin in the game, but no skin more than mine is in this game. And if I can get up in the morning and put a smile on my face and turn off MSNBC and live in the real world, then you can too, because there are some wonderful things happening in the real world. We have to stop listening to it be crafted by individuals who don't understand the real world, who want to deny it. We can't give them the luxury of defining our lives and defining reality in a way that we know is inconsistent with the science. That is it. We have to take it back. I am not a naive individual. I have worked for six governors. Five of them were Republicans before I worked for President Obama. I know we can make progress. I know it's hard. I know it can get difficult, but we are going to do it. And I was around in the early days of these, of these black smokes spewing out of smokestacks. I used to swim in Boston Harbor where, where when you got out you had to pick the oil off your legs and never tell your mother that you actually went swimming there. But my husband accounts for much of my behavior with that, that, uh, uh, that time of my life. Um, but, but it's not like that anymore. But listen, I grew up in a big Irish family. We don't give in to anybody. <laughs> you know, I come from Boston, and we say Boston strong, and that's what we mean.
And I need you to work together, and I need you during this Congress, during this time together, to recommit yourselves. Not get committed, but recommit yourselves to working together. Listen, I, I first of all want to say that uh, I am very confident of much of the work we did because we followed the science. I am confident of the work we did because we followed the law. I am most confident because we did outreach like never before. We knew that we were working for the public, not ourselves. We knew that we couldn't just identify where we wanted to go. We had to understand how where we wanted to go was constrained by the law. We had to be informed by other people's of opinions. We got so friendly with the energy world that I actually liked many of the people in the energy world. Because guess what? Energy is, is just as valuable as the environment. It is a public health necessity. And when people get so anxious and upset because we haven't made so much progress on climate change, I tell them, hey, listen, this challenge is actually an existential one. Yes, it's very important that we work very quickly. But what we're talking about that you economists know well is changing the entire economy of the world. Give me a break. It takes a little time. So let's not get discouraged. So I walk around actually with a smile on my face. I get really angry once in a while uh, because I know we have real work to do. But every day I say something to myself that my dad used to say. He used to say, Gina, just fight the good fight. That's all we're doing, right? Let's just keep working together. And I had the privilege uh, when I left EPA of spending time with uh, a lot of young people. I've been spending time at Harvard University, but also going around to other colleges. And I would suggest that you do the same. I know there's a lot of people here that have probably just graduated uh, from college. And I will tell you, there is nothing more hopeful than to speak to young people today. They are so smart. They are so tech savvy. They understand that there are inequities in the world, and they're not going to tolerate it. They know there are communities that have been left behind in the United States of America, and those communities need to be tended to. They are the ones where we need to focus the most attention. And across the world, they understand that there are millions of people every day that, uh, that die from air pollution, and that air pollution will be exacerbated under climate change, and we cannot ignore that challenge. We need to embrace it. We need to address it. We need to fix it because we created it, not the, develop, the developing world, and we need to be part of the international effort moving forward. That's what they understand. <laughs> you know, nothing good really ever comes easy, but seriously, you know, we have a, a president who, um, well, well, I should skip that part. Well, we haven't admitted, no, I really want to go down that road either. <laughs> but seriously, no. It, you know, it's no wonder that science is under attack because we have leaders in Washington who prefer to look backwards rather than forwards, and that's hard. It's hard to make the case that coal is actually the future. You know, give me a break here. And then we have, you know, folks who just want to tweet and retweet and repeat alternative facts over and over again so that we get confused, we get distracted, they mislead us, and they divide us. We cannot let that happen. And science has been the mainstay of our work in public health and the environment. And we have to remember that science is necessary to protect, and it is a frontline attack that is happening today. But seriously, how can anyone be blind to the threat of climate change. How can anyone in the United States? We spent more than $300 billion last year alone as a result of extreme weather events contributed to by climate change. We have to face these issues together. And you're going to help. <laughs> you, you young economists may not realize just how much over the course of the last few decades you have stepped up and you have helped policy folks like me change the world. 
Do you think I could have ever moved forward with any rulemaking without understanding its economic consequences? Listen, when, when, they've, when people run for office and say it's about the economy, stupid, it's because it is about the economy, stupid. That's where you come in. You stu no, no, you're not stupid. That's where you come in. You young economists need to understand that you have risen to the challenge. Look, just, just in 1981, when another great president, Ronald Reagan, was, uh, I, actually, I didn't care for him either, but he was good. Yeah, just two years after the Association of Environmental Resource Economists were founded, President Reagan issued really the first momentous executive order in this area because it required benefit cost analysis for every economically significant regulation. Now if you deal with regulations at all you know that that means uh, how many people sneeze in a neighborhood and that's probably going to be meeting the test of a major rule. Right, right Al? Everything just about falls in there. And today, now it's commonplace for every president since then to require benefit cost analysis. And I remember when that executive order was put out. I characterized it as the road to hell paid by bad intentions. I really had great faith in environmental economy at that point in time. But it, it was really foreign to all of us. It was foreign to EPA. No one had ever conceived of how you could put a dollar value on things like our precious natural resources, our wetlands. How do you calculate the benefits of reduced respiratory disease or increased IQ from eliminating lead exposure or improved visibility? How do you characterize that? How do we protect groundwater for future generations? It became clear out of the gate that these were essential components to being able to move forward because you made it part of the economy, stupid. We needed to understand that. People don't want you to tell them that you have got to get to that nice, bright, clean future, but I have no idea what you're going to sacrifice for it. They have to make choices, they need to be aware. That's what you guys continue to bring to the table. And while that first executive order went out, there was no capacity to be able to do exactly what the president said. And he went on to say that no rule should go forward unless it had a positive cost-benefit analysis. And you guys scrambled. You stood up to the test. We didn't sit around doing nothing. You helped lead the way to identify what those benefits and costs were in real, real, real data, real science. And that helped to provide strong leadership. That helped to move forward with efforts that cleaned our air, that improved visibility, that cleaned our water, delivered safe drinking water. And EPA, you guys had always worked not just in your own little, little office, but you got out and you talked to the policymakers and you talked to the engineers. Laura mentioned that when we did things, it was all hands on deck, because I came from a big family and you had to fight for your food. So when we did things, it was who's got the best idea, who's going to figure out how to get it done, who's going to tell me the best way to get through the law, and who's going to tell me how I maximize public health benefits without sacrificing our economy or our jobs. That was the task at hand. So if you think that as an EPA administrator, I ever sat there and said in my own little nerdy world, I'm just going to think about health, I'm just going to think about health, I would have lasted about a day and a half, because we serve people real human beings. They need everything, not just one thing. And you taught us how we could do that. Because through environmental economics, you taught us not just to define the problem better, but you taught us about the options and solutions. And you drove the discussion to the most cost-effective ways that, that we could actually move. You actually created things like, like stated preference methods, which I thought were ridiculous, but they worked. Seriously, how do you calculate, you know, the quantify non-use in, in existence? Good luck. You did it. And we were able to move forward. Check out what we did on regional haze, babies. It's a secret of everything. We move forward. We kick butt because you gave us the technology and the tools to be able to do it. 
And you didn't just do that, but you sort of brought new tools to the table, new ideas for how you systemically use the economy, not just in terms of the upfront cost-benefit analysis, but how you redefine the systems, like the acid rain trading program. That was an unbelievable eye-opener that environmental economists took a blast for because people like me were saying, oh, you're taxing pollution or you're selling pollution rights, right? That's what you heard over and over. And then when it started going, everybody was like, oh, holy, I, I have to be careful. I'm in a church. <laughs> holy shit, this works great. This works great. And then you taught us things like cap and trade programs that California is now initiating. The work that we did on regional greenhouse gas initiative, that's what environmental economists brought to the table. They taught us how to do it, how to make money, how to actually support our communities with the money that we gathered, and how to reduce greenhouse gases with no sacrifice. You guys taught us how to do the, most, the smartest, most cost-effective and, 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 and uh, efficient systems that could reduce the pollution that was threatening health. So I wanted to begin with that by reminding you not just how bad it used to be, but how great it is today. And when it comes to you, you need to recognize that you are a vital part of that success. You are not an ancillary little nerdy, well, you were an ancillary little nerdy people, but you are fundamental to how we do regulation and how we move forward. So don't let anybody put you on the sideline we do not put baby in a corner, folks. You got to be at the table. You got to be speaking out. Because if our science is being questioned, you have to, as a scientist, stand up and you need to tell the truth. You need to call it out when you're seeing alternative facts being delivered. Now, I'm not suggesting that you leave your, in a huff when the things aren't going your way, but talking to people, walking them through what's right what the science says is enormously important. Either you will win or you'll be able to document how it should be done. And in many ways, that's equally valuable because we ended up having to do a lot of work on things like the social cost of carbon, which many of you were working on here which were not just little static things, but they were two and three models that had to be worked together in names I don't understand. But you came up with an opportunity to put a price on carbon, and the administration under President Obama used that with great sophistication to be able to help us make good, sound decisions, calculate the economic benefits associated with that, and it allowed us to stand up and be tall in international discussions so that we could achieve a Paris Agreement. That was no small part of that effort. And I know we have to keep relying on it. I know this administration doesn't care for the social cost of carbon. Well, you wouldn't either if you denied science. You wouldn't either if you didn't think evolution was sure either. You know, these are the challenges we're facing today. But when it comes to science, you don't have the luxury, whether you're them or me, to actually decide what the end game is going to be. Science decides the end game. Science tells you where the world needs to head, what reality is and what it isn't. And so the benefits of, of the work you have done have been enormous. And they've resulted in opportunities for us to really produce uh, data that shows that, that our environmental protection measures that we've taken in, in, at EPA, particularly about the Clean Air Act, has really delivered 70 times more in benefits than it cost. And even this administration, in a report they put out last year, had to admit that we kicked butt during the Obama administration. Now, they didn't title it that, they titled it some circular number, but that's what it essentially meant. And all that means is we actually did good. We paid attention. And we're hoping that they will as well. But listen, we know that, uh, we know that coal is not coming back. But what you have to recognize is instead of looking at all of those rollbacks and listening to the news, my husband, every morning I wake up to my husband screaming at MSNBC. So I'm going to give you the same loving advice I give to him. Shut up. 
turn your TV off. Yes, they're doing rollbacks, but guess what? They're not talking to the scientists in the agency who can tell them how to do it right. They're not talking to the lawyers about what the law says, what's already been tested, what are the legal precedents, and can I make the case for these changes? They are not doing that. Instead, they are going out with fatally flawed rollback proposals. Well, good luck to them. So let's not dwell on, on rose garden announcements. Let's not call it a check mark when, when the administrator announces that he's done a proposal. A proposal is nothing. What you have to do in any final rule is to show that not a different policy needed to be developed, but that we made a mistake in the rule that just finished. Because that's what certainty means in government. When you go through the hurdle of doing a rule, you better have a damn good rule that follows. You need to be able to say why it didn't follow the law, why we didn't follow the science, how we messed up in the public process, but we didn't. And right now they are almost unanimously losing in court every time they go because they're cutting corners and they're not doing it right. So get that out of your head and get in the real world. Look at what's really happening. Not just young people who care about these issues and are going to be nipping at your heels to do the work that you are doing because they know how important it is. But we also have clean energy in the United States that's thriving. No one's going back to coal. When I read AEP and Southern Company CEOs, not usually the friendliest bunch, saying when I have a losing coal facility, guess what I'm going to do? I'm shutting it down. And guess what's happened? We have lost, oh, more than half of the coal units that were operating back in 20, 20, 2008 by 2010 had really started going out of business. Not because of EPA rules, but because there are cheaper alternatives. And right now, thankfully, the cheaper alternatives are not just liquid natural gas, not just natural gas. The cheaper alternatives are renewables, and they're getting cheaper every day. So live in the real world, folks. Don't live in DC. Now, we have real threats to the science real threats to the science. We have an administrator that is doing everything he can to undermine the rules of the road when it comes to how we do rules. And I apologize for all of you scientists out there who have a lot more time on your hands because you've been canned from an EPA co committee. Just use the time wisely. Go out golf, have a good time, enjoy yourself, regroup. Think of all the crazy things you can do when you come back again, because we will be back again. We will be there. We will be tied up in court for a very long time. We know we can't leave the Paris Agreement until well after the next election. I think two days after. That's well. <laughs> and we'll be able to, to come back with a vengeance, because we are doing the work that needs to be done. This is what democracy is all about. It's not any one individual sense of what needs to be done. It's our collective sense of what our core values are. It's our collective interest in doing the right thing and doing it on the basis of the best data that we have because people deserve to have that be the case. Look, we all know that climate change is real. We all know that man-made emissions caused it which is why women need to rule the world. So keep that in mind when you vote in, in the midterm elections. And keep, keep your eye to what, and ears to what's going on at, at EPA. We know that they're trying to diminish uh, the ability for the agency to, to look at the best science. We know they're trying to get the best scientists off of their committees so that they can make room for more industry influence. You know, we know that they're, they're trying to not actually implement the, the first environmental protection statute that we have had passed by Congress in decades by deciding that they're not going to look at the chemical. They're going to just look at impacts with the production of the product that uses the chemical. It's so there are challenges that we are facing today that are very creative, but creativity is not often rewarded in a democracy. Let me tell you what is. <laughs> Hard work. 
values, listening to people, working with people, realizing that, that the world needs facts. It doesn't need alternative facts. And that you are part of those fact makers. You are the ones that have helped us deliver the progress that we have made since way back when. You are the ones that are going to keep that progress moving. So let me stop now and take some questions, but let me end by just saying that uh, my dad used to tell me when I whined that, uh, that I, I needed to pull up my big gold pants and do something. That's what I'm gonna tell you. It's very sophisticated. <laughs> take notes. Pull up your big girl pants, your big boy pants, or your gender neutral pants, and get moving. Smile, get hopeful, don't get defeated. Work for the people in this country, they deserve it. Work for the people in other countries because we are one world. We are facing challenges that demand collaborative action, that demand that we follow the science and the law. You make sure that we keep doing that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know all the words to the Pledge of Allegiance, so allow me that. That's it. I can't wait to argue with Al McGotlin again. <laughs> Thank you, Al. All right. Yeah. Uh, are there microphones coming around? Hi, I'm Gib Metcalf from Tufts University. So thank you for a stirring call to arms. But my question to you is, what do you say when you talk to Republicans? What do you say when you talk to people who don't feel that climate is such an important issue? How do we, how do we recreate the kind of bipartisan environmental policy that really got us where we are today? Well, I can tell you how I talk to Republicans. I'm not sure that I have a, a sort of the sweet spot in how we turn around a, 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 a democracy. I think in many ways right now I'm focused on the court system more than anything else because that's what's go where we're going to win. You know, it's the backstop. There are three branches of government, but two of them don't seem to be working too well, and I'm worried about the third. Um, but, you know, honestly, I, uh, I do not think, having worked for Republicans before, um, we know that Republicans care about clean air and, climate, and, and, and they care about climate change. They just can't stand up and say it right now. That's the sad part, is that, that they're boxed in a corner because for some reason the issues of EPA, not just climate change but all of them, have been put into some kind of party platform, a partisan party platform. Ooh, the three Ps. Um, and, and we're sort of a pawn in that. That has to change. You know, I, I got many, many calls from Republican senators who berated me and said EPA should have no budget anymore, uh, and, but as soon as there's a problem in their community, man, they're giving you a call and saying, uh, they're not calling Ghostbusters, let's just put it that way. So I think, you know, there's, there's challenges there, but one thing that I'm doing now I'm actually doing two things because uh, I am, uh, I'm actually working for a private equity company, a small one, that does really good sustainability and wellness investing because the business community is starting to step up. There are signs of democracy actually waking up. That's what's going to matter. If you didn't go to the women's march, including you men, you, you so missed it. You know, it was so much fun. My favorite, my favorite sign was, uh, I can't believe we still have to march for this shit. <laughs> and if you went to the science march, my favorite was, uh, God polio me neither, thank a scientist. 
And, and, and one of them said, protons, neurons, electrons, morons, or something like that. It was, ve it was very funny. You know, there are, there are signs, I mean, and serious signs, like, like the kids in, in Parkland. Did you ever think that you could get the governor in Florida to sign a gun bill? You know, he did it because he had to do it. That's democracy. We are seeing people march for the first time since the 70s, for crying out loud. So we just have to make things clear. We have to get people excited and let them know that they can make a change. We are still a democracy. That means it's of, by, and for the people. The people have to speak. We have to do what we have to do to make sure that government is responsive to us. But I don't think any of these issues are Republican and Democrat issues. And I don't think the administration in Washington right now is a Republican administration. All right. Yep, down here. Okay. Hi, Benjamin Blantz from Hamburg. How do we change the system such that people actually engage and march without it becoming bad first? Yeah. Well, I think we're already there, so we probably don't have to change it for right now. <laughs> it's, it's bad now. It could get worse. You know, I... You know, part of it is, you know, what ignited things before uh, when, when I was younger is that in the, in what we're facing now is, is the difficulty is that pollution was very visible before. Nobody was questioning whether they were being harmed. The challenge with, is with things like climate change, which, are, which is the biggest public health issue that we face, not to mention the biggest economic issue and national security challenge, as if it's unrelated to the migration I issues that are, that, are, that are underpinning immigration challenges. I mean, you can see it. It's happening, uh, but it's so elusive to explain. You know, we really have to stop talking in lingo, and we have to, I believe, we have to actually um, make it relevant to people. If you look at the polling, people in the United States understand that climate change is happening. They just don't think it's about them. We have to make the consequences of climate change clear to people and let them know that they can do something about it, that this isn't an overwhelming difficult challenge that we can't step up and fix. The minute you do that, people will deny it. Or they'll run away from it and they'll never talk to you again, which happens to me quite often. But I am, I am at the School of Public Health at Harvard because public health impacts in my lifetime have been what mattered to people the most. If we can talk about this as being about your family, your kids, their future, then people will take to the streets and they'll demand action. I think it's when we get too lofty, that it, too um, n nerdy, for lack of a better word, uh, but we have to stop talking as if this isn't about people and we have to get them engaged and make them understand that they can make a difference. I, th I, be I firmly believe they can, because we know that people know climate change is happening. It's ridiculous to think otherwise. So we, we can't let that capture the field. We just have to continue to run and engage people. Information is still power. That's the difficulty of what this administration is doing at EPA in particular, is they're messing up the information that we need to rely on to make decisions. They're denying the ability to use the best science. And that's, that's the difficulty, is we need to not play by those rules, but play by the real ones. Inspiring speech I've ever seen that mentions stated preference. Um. <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, when someone explained it to me, I said, we can't do that, really? And Same. I was like, whoa! <laughs> um, also, I have something self-serving. I'm running for state legislature as an environmental economist, and I wanted to know if I could get a picture of you with, with of you course. after this. Thank of you. Of course. <laughs> Come on up. We have some over here. It's been a couple of hands raised. I know I have one more minute left. Run! Um, on a down note, yeah, um, I'm a little bit concerned about the changes that are more that are less sexy, uh, that doesn't get public attention, yep. but that are 
really fundamental, right? So one of the changes now is you can't rely on science that's based on non-disclosed data. Yeah. Right? So it's an easy way to sell to people who don't understand why you need non-disclosure by saying, well, we need transparency, right? So these kind of changes and then placing new federal judges all over the system, those yep. are longer term changes that haven't got yep. much tweeting or attention, yep. but those are the things that are going to have long run impacts. So what's your view on that? Well, that, that's the reason why I'm here, is this is not the sexiest crowd. <laughs> right? We, our work is not particular. All right, individually you are, as a crowd, not so much. The, I, I, I am here because I am really not worried about, about the rollbacks half as much as I'm worried about the actual underpinnings of science that are being unraveled today. But have you tried to explain to somebody who isn't a scientist why transparency isn't a really good thing? I, you know, it's so fundamental. We look at this and say, okay, this is not about transparency. This is they don't like the six city study and they don't want us to do any cohort studies because all cohort studies require that we maintain confidentiality of the participants. They don't want to expose their health to the world or give it to the administrator of EPA. I have at least five different private sector companies watching my, my personal information because it's been leaked by the federal government or the state government. Nobody's gonna go for the system they've set up. But try to explain that. We have to get better at understanding that and understanding how we communicate that. This is just trying to undermine our ability to use science. The, co the benefit cost thing that just went out as a, an, a, an ANPR, as an advance notice, you know, it's very clear to me exactly why that's being put out. They don't want to count co-benefits. Co well, I will guarantee you that co the co-benefit issue has been argued and argued in the courts endlessly, but they want to get rid of the MATS rule and the endangerment finding underpinning it. I know they do. It's not a secret. They want to go to, the, the, to actually rewrite the, the Clean Power Plan, and to do that, they need to find a reason to make it look good when they dismantle it. So they have to change the rules on how you count and how you look at it and what data you use. So they want to just stop co-benefits because most of the benefits of the Clean Power Plan were co-benefits. So it's, these are very difficult way, things to communicate, but if you are not paying attention and you don't think your voice is necessary to comment on these, then we're lost. I need you to step up with your expertise and sit down at your computer and file comments. Because what they forget, and what I know dearly well, is that every comment needs to be responded to in the docket or you will get it tossed back to the agency by the courts. So inundate them with real information. Make them explain why you don't count co-benefits. Make, really make them do their job. Because every time that you submit a comment that is substantive and you are the group that can do it best, then it gives us the, the ability to pull those comments out, explain it to a broader audience, and you give us the ability to challenge it in court if they haven't answered your comments sufficiently. And they can't answer them because they're wrong. You know, so that's why I'm here. So I don't, I'm not questioning whether we should be upset or concerned. What I'm questioning is, do we sit around and mope or do we do what we need to do to actually get the job done and protect our kids' future? Because it is about my family. I have my very first grandchild who's gonna be born on August 25th. He's gonna be 32 in 2050. I thought that was so far away until I figured that out. Now I'm like, damn, <laughs> I'm not gonna sit around and do nothing and that's all I'm asking is as you get together, rev one another up. Get together as a little group of commenters and then sep separate yourself out and file them 5,000 times. <laughs> Go to Congress, learn how to talk to people. Go to your communities and say, there's things you're not reading about. You gotta pay attention to this stuff because don't you wanna know what things mean for you and your family? That's what I want you to do. 
And I think that if we keep working the system, then that's what a democracy is about because it is a participatory sport. And we have taken it for granted for too long. And now we know the price of that, emp that apathy of not getting to the polls, not paying attention. So I, I am not suggesting that you dumb down what you do because you're smart and you're valuable and your information is so worthwhile. Just take the time to get it into the system. Take the time to, to actually participate in these processes because they're vital to my grandson. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. This is a good start, a great start. We really like doing this. I think it, we're the only group of environmental economists who's been crazy enough to have two big conferences here. So 10 years ago, we, we had a European conference and we were in the same church. So um, that was a fantastic start, Gina. Thanks so much. We're very inspired. And it's nice to hear that, although we're not sexy, that we're at least we're useful in our nerdiness. <laughs> now, um, I have two things. I, I will first give you the Lord Mayor's speech, because the Lord Mayor is paying for the reception drinks afterwards. <laughs> and she couldn't come. She had an even worse cold than me, right? So. I'm testing this uh, plus two degrees centigrade thing uh, at a personal level, so bear with me if I start coughing. Uh, it seems that the mayor of Gothenburg is even worse. But anyway, she sent a speech at my suggestion. On behalf of the city of Gothenburg, I would like to welcome you all to our beautiful city. It's a city of warmth, home to engineers and entrepreneurs, a green city and a sustainable city, open to the world. Throughout our history, we have embraced people and influences, and throughout the ages, the city has developed with ideas and knowledge all around the world. This week, Gothenburg is proud to host the third, this World Congress of Environmental and Resource Economists. The climate issue is one of our greatest challenges. The decisions we make now are crucial to the planet and future generations, and we in Sweden want to increase the pace of becoming a fossil-free fossil welfare country and to focus on sustainable development. I really hope this Congress will be interesting and that you will make many new friends, get new ideas and influences, and that you will have the opportunity to meet and network. Thank you. So in a moment, there will be the uh, drinks offered by the uh, mayor. But I, um, <laughs> I wanted to say a few words of my own because I, I really feel uh, glad and touched that we can have this kind of a conference. We're, we are, after all, privileged. We should count our blessings. We are privileged still to fly around the world and discuss important questions. Still, it's clear that we're gathering under the ominous clouds of two crises. There is a crisis of the environment, and there is a crisis of democracy that Gina very clearly showed, showed, gave those of us who are not Americans, gave us a feeling, I think, of the intensity of feeling and debate currently in the US. On the other hand, we know that there are so many countries where democracy is threatened by authoritarian rule that it would be easier to try to count the countries where that's not the case. It's rather hard to think of any really good countries. When you're thinking of, we have this notion of the democratic West, uh, West of what? 
But anyway, it's hard to enumerate very many countries where you feel safe about this concept at the moment. <clears throat> so I have a, I do have a slide presentation of sorts. This is a baobab tree. And um, people have gathered under baobab trees uh, for generations in, uh, in, in Africa and um, they're, they're momentous trees. They can live for thousands of years and so it's nice to gather in the shade and, and have meetings if you can't fly across the world and go to Gothenburg. And uh, <coughs> Stantik Superi, who wrote this uh, wonderful little book, uh, Le Petit Prince, he, he warned uh, of the baobab tree. It looks sweet in the beginning when it's small, but it's a bit like carbon dioxide. A little bit is okay, but if, you, um, if you're not careful, it will take over your planet, as you can see in this picture. Now, the baobab trees across Africa are dying. These are trees that uh, live thousands of years, but uh, there's a serious concern I read in Nature recently that they are dying and they're analyzing, not quite sure of the if reasons, but it's believed to be climate related. And if it is, then it puts it very much in the same category of, as the coral reefs, which are, I think the most beautiful thing we can uh, still see, but they are going rather fast. And as you know, even with one and a half degrees warming, uh, most coral reefs will, will be fatally affected. There's many other indicators, um, sort of canaries in the mine. We have um, only half the bees left, the pollinators in Europe. Male sperm in humans, it seems, has decreased to half. We have many other signs of, uh, to worry about. When, when we calculate the costs and propose policies, we generally assume sense. We assume sense stable economies growing and then a sensible policy to deal with, let's say, climate change. That's how all climate change cost calculations are done. This is where the two crises kind of join together. Suppose you don't have sensible policies. Suppose you have leaders who think trade wars are fun. When in that, if you combine that with, with resource problems, uh, climate problems uh, and other problems, we don't know what the cost will be. It's hard to calculate. Anyway, this all goes to show how central environmental economics is and has become. It used to be thought of as a bit of a marginal discipline, but it's very much at the center of efforts to defend welfare. And so uh, we should, I, and I thank you, Gina, it was, it was nice to hear that from, from an administrator at the EPA that we are useful and, uh, and that we, what we do is, is, can be used. Still, <clears throat> the next task is to invite you to go to the drinks, so I don't want you to be too gloomy. <laughs> we are, as I said before, still privileged to have the opportunity of this kind of meeting. And we all know that you can stay at home and have a good week reading articles. But this meeting has cost a few thousand tons in carbon dioxide to get us all here. And to make that investment profitable, we have to have fun. We <laughs> what did I just say? <laughs> <laughs> we have to make new friends, right? Because reading articles we can do at home. But uh, making friends, and we, we just had this workshop here, for instance, for women in, in development and environment, and they're promoting this green bracelet here. Um, because um, some of those people would like to speak to my peers here, the icons of this, uh, of this profession. And uh, so the idea is you wear one of these and, 
and those who might be shy from far away uh, would feel encouraged to come and talk to you. So it's a sign that you want dialogue. And so um, that is the purpose here. That, uh, As I keep on telling, we've got our sponsors here in the background, and I want to thank them all. In particular, Volvo was kind of uh, in, involved in sponsoring this session, the Environment for Development, and SIDA, which um, financed the large number of stipends from, from low- and middle-income countries, and um, the School of Economics for, with various foundations that's, that supported this conference. Um, and the mayor, who, will, uh, who has paid for the drinks that we will now have. So, <laughs> so please, with this, uh, let's thank uh, Gina once more, and let's go off and have drinks.